So what we're doing here is a, a panel session. It's a panel session with alumni. Um, and the main aim is really to get an idea of what careers look like after studying in this place. Um, and so I have a, I have a selection, <laughs> am I right here, um, who I'll introduce in just a second. Um, before I start, I should say something about the Bartlett. Um, the Bartlett is the Faculty of Built Environment at UCL. And actually, built environment is, a, is a, an odd description for it now, because we seem to be extending well beyond what people will traditionally have considered the built environment. We have uh, architecture, we have planning, we have construction and project management, uh, we have a whole range of building science related um, areas, environmental design and so forth. Uh, but we've also opened up uh, new areas of work in things like the Institute of Global Prosperity, which is something you say, well, what on earth is that? Well, actually, that's about transferring ideas that come from the Global South about how you can live your life in a sustainable way into um, the West and the, the North, if you like. Um, so it's run by um, somebody called Henrietta Moore, who's an anthropologist and happens to study Kenya and areas of Kenya where there are uh, particular groups who actually just live their lives in a very sustainable way. Quality of life more than material goods. So that's just an, an example of a kind of thing. Uh, we've got an institute of innovation and public purpose. And that institute is all about trying to redress the way that people think about public sector um, in um, whether or not innovation takes place in the public sector. A lot of the rhetoric at the moment is that the private sector innovates, the role of government is really just to regulate and uh, balance the playing field for everybody else. Well, Mariana Matsukato, who's the economist, who's the director of that institute, is rebalancing uh, that discourse and establishing some new programs and so forth. So these are the kinds of things we're moving into. Why are we doing that? Well. <coughs> The world now is over 50% urban. And if you look at places like China, um, the driving force for growth in the economy of China over the last 20 years has been urbanization. Urbanization means building buildings, it means building infrastructure, it means you know, the whole remit of, of city making and city building. And that's the driving force, actually, behind the world economy. It's not only taking place in China, it's taking place throughout the world. If you go around all parts of Asia, if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and so forth, cities are mushrooming. And that's happening at such a rate um, that it's a wonderful thing, because actually the least affluent in the world are becoming more affluent. Um, last week, we had or maybe it was earlier this week, I, I forget when, Monday, uh, we had uh, Branko Milanovic uh, come and give a lecture. And he's the demographer who has this wonderful elephant-shaped um, uh, graph that is something that describes the growth of affluence of the, the lower percentiles of income groups in the world, massive sort of hump, and then it drops to nothing at the 75th percentile, no growth in affluence over the last 20 years. And then its trunk goes shooting up there because in the Western world, um, no growth in affluence amongst our working classes, but the rich are, are much better off now than they ever used to be. Yeah? And that elephant-shaped diagram is quite famous. But that creates a problem. It creates a problem for the West because all of a sudden we have um, a working class who are seeing the world getting more affluent both below them and above them, and they feel disenfranchised. And hence, Trump, Brexit, Bolsonaro, Erdogan, you can see those sort of uh, politics that are creeping in. So all of this is tied together, and it's all tied together to urbanization and to the built environment. And for, for that reason, uh, you need a faculty of this shape that brings together all of these different ways of thinking to begin to think about sustainability, climate change, uh, design, community cohesion. How do you do this? How do you get it right? 
And so unless you've got all of that going on in one place, you can't have the interesting conversations that allow us to tackle the real challenges that we see in the world today. So that's the sort of the shape of the faculty. Okay, what we're here for is careers. Now, I'm probably the last person that you should look to on this because I have been here for about 40 years. Um, I, I came here as an undergraduate student in 1975, uh, did my architecture degree, uh, went out and worked in a health authority, actually, at the time, um, got rather bored. Door schedules are tedious things which you had to draw in those days. It wasn't on a computer. Yeah. Um, so I came back, did a master's degree, and got sucked into research. And then I've been stuck here ever since. So, um, not, not the model. And it's for that reason that on my right, we have um, Eleanor. And Eleanor Huggett is an environmental designer at uh, Foster and Partners. Uh, we've got uh, Luna Ishad, who's a director at Wingate White Real Estate. And we've got uh, Matthew Wilkinson, who's an associate at ALNA. And they are going to, are we just going to go do it in that order? Shall we do it in that order? They're going to tell you something about their careers. Um, and we'll end up with questions, actually, I think, at the end of it. But we'll take it step, step by step. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Helena, over to you. <laughs> okay, so I'll go first. Um, so, yeah, I did the Masters in Environmental Design and Engineering in 2011 and 2012. Um, before that, I actually did a maths degree um, and decided that actually I wanted to work in sustainability, doing something positive with my career, um, and also that I wanted to work with buildings. So I thought, you know, with a maths degree, what can I do? Something to do with engineering. So I looked around, talked to, made kind of reached out to people in that community and asked for advice and basically the advice I got was that the Bartlett's the place to go and this master's course is the one to do and if you do that then you'll put yourself in a really great position. So um, that's what I did <laughs> and it's worked out well for me. Um, so I studied the course and then after that I spent four years working at Max Fordham which is a small building services consultancy um, as an engineer and sustainability consultant. Um, from there, I spent a couple of years working at the UK Green Building Council, so that was much more to do with research and advocacy on behalf of sustainability in the built environment. Um, and from there, I moved to Foster's, which I've been at for a year, um, back into a design role, which I'm really enjoying. And I can talk more about that, but I think we're supposed to be doing a summary at the moment. Just a summary to start? Yeah. Would be good. <laughs> so I'll let you uh, take over. Um, so I came to UCL to study my undergraduate, which is a bachelor's in mechanical engineering at UCL with business finance at LSE. Um, I wanted to really think like an engineer and work in the world of business. Um, and after my undergraduate, I wanted a bit more of the business side and I thought integrating elements of project management into that would give me what I really wanted. And coming to the Bartlett was what I really wanted to do. It was it's a, one of the best um, project management schools um, in, in Europe, um, so I managed to, to do my master's here. Um, and right after my master's, I managed to, to score basically um, a project management role at the Mayor's Investment Arm, London and Partners, where I got the chance to work with um, a number of international companies that are looking to move into the London economy. Um, these companies included financial services, um, tech startups, hospitality. Um, and many different companies. Um, and one of them was uh, a Qatari French cross-border investment company that focused on the real estate asset. Um, so I started working for them as a country manager. And three years ago, um, I realized that the real estate industry is quite inefficient uh, when it comes to international investments. Um, and so I decided to set up Wingate White, which is a company that provides uh, intelligence um, and advisory to international firms looking to invest into the real estate industry. Um, so that's what I'm doing so far. I'm quite involved with, with UCL and I think that's why I was invited here today. Um, I do the International Student Orientation Program, I mentor students, I also mentor uh, real estate economics and finance students at the LSE. Um, and I think one thing to mention here is that uh, UCL is a great university uh, in itself, as well as the Bartlett Department, for anyone who's quite interested in participating um, and, and kind of 
you know, building the community um, and to stay connected even after you graduate. So you'll find that there's a whole community and it's called the UCL uh, alumni community and you just you can go in and talk to other alumni or students. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. Um, hi, Matt Wilkinson. Um, I studied undergraduate uh, architecture at the Bartlett, uh, three years which I probably frequently describe as thrilling and exhausting. Um, it was pretty tough, uh, but it was really, really exciting. Um, I then spent two years working for uh, a couple of different practices. Uh, one kind of lone practitioner architect, uh, which was equally intense, <laughs> working with one guy. Uh, and then I worked with a small practice doing uh, urban kind of framework studies, urban realm uh, projects that emerged out of those urban framework studies, mainly in London. Um, we worked, uh, we won the first competition that was tendered as part of the Olympic project in London, the Greenway, which is the park that runs over the northern outfall sewer. Um, I came back to do my diploma at the Bartlett. Um, I don't think, trying to think about what the reasoning for that was, I'm not totally sure. I think I knew people at the bar, I knew that the program offered a kind of, uh, a level of free thinking and a level of kind of uh, maverick kind of nature, I guess, that I was interested in. Um, so I came back and spent two really exciting years doing my diploma here. Um, and then uh, when I left, I uh, managed to get myself a job at Future Systems um, and uh, I spent six, about six, six, eight months working at Future Systems and we were doing a massive project for News International uh, trying to uh, convert the printing presses and editorial uh, business in Wapping into uh, a new kind of international headquarters for uh, News Corp. Uh, I then worked on a tall, uh, increasingly, or growing a tower that seemed to get taller and taller and taller in East London until it didn't become anything. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we, uh, we won the competition to uh, design the new wing, I don't really like the word wing, but anyway, let's say wing, extension, all the horrible words that they are at the v &A Museum in South Kensington. And I spent seven years uh, as project architect uh, basically taking that project from competition all the way through to completion and I'm now uh, running uh, a project at Paisley Museum in Paisley which is very close to Glasgow um, and um, leading uh, not every but some competitions in the office. Thank you very much. So form <laughs> is really to start asking questions and answering your questions. Um, have I got any any instant takers? Because if not, I'm going to I'm going to kick off with one uh, for for Luna actually. Um, where one of our new institutes that we've just established is the Institute of Real Estate, and what we're working on is um, actually real estate has never been something we've done in the Bartlett. It's not been not been a big. Um, a big sort of professional route through. We've had programs that have real estate with planning, real estate and infrastructure and construction and so forth. Um, but real estate itself is, is something that's done in places like Reading and Cambridge and in, in other universities. So to have a, an entity like real estate, what we did was we decided we were going to focus on how you value the things that it's hard to put numbers to. So the value of heritage, or the value of sustainability perhaps, or the value of urban placemaking. Now those are all areas where our planners understand about placemaking, or our Institute of Sustainable Heritage understands about heritage. But by looking at it from a perspective of value, can we shift the way the whole industry invests in rather than demolishing the pub before it gets listed so that you've got a nice clean site to build on. Um, actually thinking, if they're going to list it, maybe it's valuable, and it could make my development more valuable. Uh, so it's about shifting perceptions is our, our overall aim. How does this relate to the work that you do? Is this something that would be valuable? 
Um, I think when it comes to an investor, actually, if you can portray it as a good investment, then it will be something that's valuable to the investor. Investors look for different things, so it really depends on who the investment is um, and what kind of assets they're looking to integrate into their portfolio. Uh, the one thing that I would say about, for example, uh, the, the pub example, if it was listed, it might be a bit more difficult for them to shift its use, it might be a bit more expensive for them to, to and get planning permissions even, um, so it will be restricted in a sense, however, if you are able to structure it in a certain way that would be interesting, um, if it's attached to a certain uh, reputation or a certain area that might make it uh, part of, of, a, of a heritage, then, then it would come across as more valuable and you would find some investors that would uh, be interested in investing in it. I think that um, I probably work with international investors and they've been attracted to the UK market because of what it offers. The first thing is the rule of law is very clear when it comes to real estate investments. Um, the second thing is there is a lot of statistics that allow them to study the market very well um, and for them to be able to um, assess and value the current opportunity and make forecasts uh, based on that uh, current market uh, analysis and asset analysis. A lot of the assets that they invest to tend to have a good track record. Um, and, and that all makes it part of the, the sound uh, investment. I think that um, heritage and many other things that you've mentioned would be interesting, but I think they would be, have to be presented a certain way because they're not currently, real estate industry is not currently being attracted to that. And I think it just it hasn't been structured that way and put forward to the investor in that way, but I think it's definitely possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I just jump in on that? Yes, please. <laughs> um, because I think coming from a consultancy point of view, very often in my team we're working with the architects in-house to make projects basically as sustainable and environmentally friendly as possible. Um, and sometimes we get a really great client um, who's really, really keen to make that one of the main focuses of the project. And other times, the client is interested in the bottom line and they're making an investment and what they want to do is maximize, maximize the return on that investment. And so they might view sustainability and environmental design as a nice to have or an add-on. Um, and so any ways in which we can understand how they kind of speak their language, I guess, and understand what their drivers are, um, so that we can have a more coherent conversation and they can understand the value of what we're trying to put forward is a really, really positive thing to have. So from my point of view, hearing that you're bringing that into the department is, I think, a very, very good thing. I don't know if you, you want to add. I'm thinking about your tower, which went up and up and up until it yeah. didn't exist. <laughs> I mean, um, I don't know. Um, I, maybe I have a naive architect hat on or an ideological architect hat on, I don't know, but I, I don't love the word value. <laughs> um, you don't like value? I like value, I don't like the connotations of the word value. It always, it's a word that is so synonymous with finance and, and money, I find that it's difficult to steer that away to something that is other than that. And I would be, say, interested in the Department of Real Estate if they were actually, if or if they were trying to understand <laughs> I'm going to use the word because I can't think of another one. <laughs> if there was ever value in just doing the right thing. That's it, public value. And that's, and that's kind of something else, but I, it's just, I, I would love to just spend, you know, it would be amazing to spend time in that field just to find a word that wasn't value <laughs> <laughs> that you could use in those terms, I think, is, and that would... Yeah, no, they still trigger the same. I mean, that, that is exactly what it is, by the way. It's about intangible value. That's the value you can't put on pound yeah. notes, yeah, um, and or public value, if you like. So, from from the floor, um, you've come here this afternoon. You've you've been looking at thinking about programs and so forth. Is there anybody who's got any particular areas of of program they're interested in? Uh, that relate to some of the things you've heard so far about about our sample of careers and so regarding PhD research. Yes. Uh, can you explain a little bit about bench fees and why do you expect someone to come in one day a week? And for people that work like myself, it's doing a part-time PhD. I want to do part-time PhD. Yeah. 
So, um, I mean, part-time PhDs, absolutely, um, we, we take them all the time. For a lot of people who are practitioners, it's the only feasible way of doing a PhD. Uh, so we welcome it. Um, they can be absolutely phenomenal doing a part-time PhD, partly because the real risk of our PhDs is that you could become entirely isolated. You're studying this thing for three years and you become the world expert in it. And if you're engaged in that real concentrated, focused work, you can find that you just lose everything else. Yeah. So doing it part-time is actually quite nice because you've got a day job and you've got this. It's also quite nasty because it's an awful lot of work. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily mix so easily. Um, normally, I see my part-time PhD um, approximately once a month. She comes in. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it can be every week if there's a period where she really needs, you know, continual um, supervision. It can be, you know, sort of six weeks and, and I don't see her. Yeah. Um, the, just to give you an example, um, the one I'm thinking of is studying the briefing process. And so what she's had the opportunity to do is to study the briefing process for this building when it got refurbished and for the other building that is being built at UCL East um, in Stratford that's currently going through briefing. I can tell you these are a gold mine for understanding the briefing process and how it can go wrong. Yeah. Uh, also how it can go right, but uh, it's, been, it's been an absolutely fascinating opportunity um, to really have a person in the room during briefing meetings for high value client buildings just doing anthropology on them actually. What she's doing is observing exactly how people interact, what's the nature of the negotiations and going to a whole series of meetings. <coughs> because she's doing all of that field work, she's actually doing much more than just seeing me every so often. You know, she's having to box and cox with that with her day job, which is an architectural practice. Uh, so she's spending probably two days a week doing PhD, um, and she's negotiated that with her employer. Yeah. Um, bench fees, she's not paying any bench fees, but she's not using benches. Um, there may be, on occasion, for somebody doing something quite scientific, a need to make sure that there's a fee to pay uh, for that, but in this faculty, I think that's not the norm. Uh, if you were doing chemistry, more like it. Yeah. Um, anything else in that area? Okay. Still, but I'd love to see it becoming more collaborative and um, working at Foster's so previously I was at Max Fordham which is a standalone consultancy and moving from there to Foster's where we're in-house um, it is an amazing difference being in the same building as the architects and so for example I was working on the tulip I don't know if anyone here saw the tulip that came out so I spent four months co-located in a room with the rest of the team the structural engineers the architects um, the electrical engineers vertical transportation environmental design all of us were in a room together for four months working full time on it um, to pull the planning application together and that meant that um, anything that arose where coordination or discussion was needed could just be fixed and it was an incredibly efficient and enjoyable way of working and that's one example I would love to do more of that I think it works it's a much more efficient way of working I would say um, there has to be, a, in, in my field of work, this kind of communication. So with Wingate White, uh, we were able to work on many different projects that are very different from one another by basically building a new team around each client. So for each client, we build a new team uh, of experts, and this includes a new uh, financing arm, a legal team, uh, accounting, tax structure, uh, quantity surveyors, valuers. Um, and quants and um, other people that provide different kind of information and analytics and things change with new information each day 
And so you'd have to relay that information and discuss amongst each other as a newly formed team uh, from different companies and different expertise. Uh, and I think that kind of uh, you know, cross communication is very important and working and collaboration has been very important. Um, and that's you know, with different companies each time. Um, so it's definitely something that, that we like to do. Yes, we're going on. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just think it's a, it's a kind of given for us now. We, I mean, we, we couldn't do, we actually literally couldn't do what we do without all of these people around us and without communicating in a kind of very even, equal way. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I, it's, we, I mean, I don't know, in the office we often talk about starting everything with a conversation rather than a sketch because already by putting a sketch down you're committing too much and actually the conversation will open. I think there is there's some spin in there, but it's also quite real. Um, I think the way our office is structured is also about that kind of collaboration. Um, and I think you maybe realize how much you're collaborating on a good job when you work on a job where you don't <laughs> do it very well um, more because it, if everything's working nicely it's kind of just inherent and happening and it's kind of it's difficult to identify kind of exactly what parts of the process are making it work like that until something doesn't work and then you're just like oh why aren't we sort of talking in quite the same way um, and I think as we work more globally, we work with more international teams, it becomes even more and more important. And um, so, yeah, so I just think it, it has to be at the, at the kind of top of everything. And just, just to follow up on that, so are you seeing any members of the team join that they have that skill set, or is there still something that they can do now that they can do <laughs> to be more collaborative and be part of the team and dealt with something? It's really interesting. Um, I think the, the learning how to with your audience is still probably one of the things I have entrenched in my head most from being here. Um, I've heard that a lot um, when I was here and I always found it really powerful and I think the more you go into the world and you do start presenting to different audiences and when you see a project even through, if you see a project all the way through from the beginning to the end, you know, the way you present an idea to a senior team at competition stage, the way you present an idea to a planning officer the way you present what you need someone to do to build to a contractor and then to a subcontractor who is just not even looking at the piece of paper, you really learn that lesson really quickly. Um, so, and then I think the more I see different, uh, our team growing, people coming from different places, you realize that it's, everyone has their own different take on it. And I find that I can communicate very well verbally, so that means maybe I don't push the kind of graphic communication as hard, but there are other people in the office, and we have a very international office, the UK or British is definitely the minority, and I find it really fascinating when people who communicate much less well verbally step in in a totally different way, and they, the graphic skill that comes with that, so I think it isn't about doing everything perfect is just about working to your strengths and you find different ways to communicate with different people depending on what your skills are and I think that's really fascinating because that's about who we are as much as the process. There's a really interesting thing about this which is, I mean, part of the point of having this faculty that has all of these different bits with different disciplinary views of the world um, is about that challenge. And so you come in, you do your degree in architecture or your degree in planning. Uh, but when you go out and work, you're going to be in a multidisciplinary team actually doing something with a whole lot of people from different disciplinary backgrounds. So I don't know if we do it as well as we could here at the moment. But I don't know from a student's point of view whether they actually get to talk to people from other programs in such a way that you can learn the languages that people use and appreciate it and trust. I think we could do better. We do it in first year undergraduate where architects, planners and construction project management undergraduates all work together. Um, highly problematic, but actually they make friendships. Um, so it probably works to a degree. So questions for all three. What would you say or if there was any, 
extracurricular benefits you did outside of your course of study that benefited towards your career aspirations or role, your first role in graduate school? Is that specifically while at UCL? Yes. Um, so I did my undergraduate and my postgraduate at UCL, and I literally tried everything possible from playing the bongos on Tuesday nights to dancing tango and salsa all night. And I think with extracurricular activities, some of them will uh, look very nice on paper, but also uh, another very important element of it is for you to feel like you're part of the community here at UCL and meet new people from different courses and get the chance to to be people from different parts of the world so they're interested in very different things. And I think that kind of learning is very valuable. <laughs> I know we have a question from <laughs> but it's very valuable. So, so I've done a lot of, you know, you have the chance to try a lot of sports and, and different kinds of clubs and societies, uh, but you can also participate by becoming a representative with the student union. Um, so I was running for different uh, positions each year, and I've done different things from the strategic uh, planning committee to being a student academic representative uh, to being on the quality uh, control committee. So there are a lot of things that you can participate in. It really depends on what you're looking for um, and the kind of experience that you're looking for. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> no, this Jack is probably a dull boy. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I think even if you don't. There's different levels of extracurricular activity. I guess I didn't really engage in the, the social side in the way, or the sort of sports, or the, those kinds of activities in the way you did it. But something I always really uh, enjoyed was, and this is the cross cultures that actually I quite like that you would go and find someone in a chemistry department to help you throw some chemicals together to make a particular mess on a piece of metal or something. You know, it's kind of like, so I think there was this. There's the other side of the extracurricular to the architecture department or to whatever department you're in, but actually they're still kind of curricular, they're still studying, but it's always nice to root out those people and kind of borrow their skills for a while. It's a different angle. It's, it, this is a real challenge, you know, because uh, education has got higher and higher pressure. And there's so much pressure. You think you're spending all this money doing this and you've really got to get everything out of it and, and so on. But actually, it's a great pity if you don't take advantage of the time that you've got in a university to make the network connections, to bridge across to other disciplines, to take advantage of societies or whatever else it happens to be. Um, <coughs> so, you know, don't feel too much pressure would be my recommendation. Your tutors, of course, will be pressing you to deliver and to, you know, rework things and make them even better and put in more and more time. And your peers also will do the same. So it's something to be, you have to really be quite, I think, effective in your management of time so that you've got time to, yeah, if you're one of those procrastinators, um, like I am actually, you put things off and put things off and put things off, and you end up fiddling around and wasting all the time you could have been spending partying more constructively. <laughs> Not probably, that's probably a bit flippant. But. <laughs> yes? What would you say are the biggest benefits of having studied at the postgraduate level? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't mind going first. Um, for me, there were two things. One is, is, we've kind of talked about a bit the connection of people that I met working at, um, studying at the Bartlett. Um, a lot of whom I'm still in contact with, um, both in London and also globally. Um, and also having worked at the Bartlett and being an alumnus of the Bartlett, um, just in terms of career opportunities, has definitely opened a lot of doors for me because it's meant that people have looked at my CV and said, oh, you did a master, you did the EDE at the Bartlett, yeah, we're definitely interested in interviewing you. And it's kind of just like, so for me, yeah. And then also, <laughs> those are the kind of tangible career benefits, but I had an absolutely brilliant time, learned a huge amount and made really, really great friends. So it's just, yeah. All good. Yeah. No regrets. No regrets. No, not even the <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I think the workshop was, was very valuable because it took me from thinking about engineering very specifically and, and business finance and really thinking about projects and how projects are structured and how you can really deliver a project and really my entire work career now revolves around projects. Um, so that was absolutely essential. I think it was a very uh, important move for me and it was, uh, you get to really think um, and, and learn from people who are at the forefront of their fields. Um, and I think that's something that, that you will find here at the board that um, uh, made amazing friends as well, had a great university experience, um, and, and I actually got the chance to, to use these, these project delivery skills um, outside of my career. So I, I host a, a film festival, the Barbican, and you know, a bunch of other things that are project-based. So it's, it's really good for your career, but also it's, I think, quite rewarding. Uh, both what you can learn here as well as the people that you're going to meet here. Um, I think really, I mean, it's different. I guess uh, I studied architecture, so there's kind of a natural, you, you're sort of, there's a slight kind of mandatory element to it. Um, but I don't think that's the right answer. Um, I think when I did undergrad at the Bartlett doing architecture, you sort of, I felt a lot like a sponge in that you're just soaking up, soaking up, soaking up, soaking up. There's so much kind of knowledge intake, processes, kind of materials, kind of, you know, physics, knowledge, everything is kind of being thrown at you. And and I think uh, when I kind of came and did my diploma, then it was sort of very different because it's a, time, a period of time where actually you get to kind of reshuffle all of that information that you've absorbed and shuffle it into a kind of logic that makes sense for you. And so actually it was two years where I got to really think for myself. Not that I wasn't thinking for myself before, but kind of in a much more, um, it was just a much more self-sufficient kind of, I was directing my own study, you know, with all of this amazing impetus around you and knowledge and guidance, but it was much more sort of self-led because it was just a and so I sort of, for me, that was the most important thing, I think. I mean, one of the things I think that people do find is exactly that, that you go off, you do your degree, you came out of school, you probably didn't quite know why you did that degree, or you're, you, know, you thought you did, but then you found it was a different thing. You maybe go out and work for a year or two, and you come back and do a master's degree. Actually, you've just matured a lot and all of a sudden you're in a position where you know why you're going to do this. It's, you've got ideas about what you hope to get out of it. Uh, it may be I want to make myself you know, fit into this career, or it may be that I just have a real interest in a, a more sustainable world, or, or whatever it happens to be. But you've got a real sort of much more mature understanding, and that changes education. So the form of education that you get at postgraduate level um, is actually much more about you, it's a much more directed thing in a, in a funny way. That's, that's my personal experience of it. And then, of course, I made the big mistake of getting sucked in. <laughs> uh, so I just stayed. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Any questions from this side? That's how I'll be talking. <laughs> Anything you expected us to talk about that we've not talked about? Yes? I'll ask a bit of a silly question. What's, do you have like a favourite memory or highlight or something <laughs> any of your time at UCL or the Bartlett or anything like that? Um, well, on the EDU start the year with a trip to Wales where we all go to the Centre for Alternative Technology for four days in rural Wales um, and it's it's a kind of icebreaker trip so everyone gets to know each other and it's also the Centre for Alternative Technology you get to play around with kind of solar panels making your own solar panels that kind of thing um, and learning really ha in a very hands-on way about sustainable buildings um, and I mean that that was an absolutely brilliant trip um, learned a lot and re it really brought us together as a course, we kind of really bonded with each other in a really nice way. Um, so it was a good balance I'd say of partying and studying. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was a really great memory, pick that one.
I think mine would be uh, one sunny day in October. Um, I was walking down the quad, which is the main area, and I happened to spot two people that were doing masters with me. And 15 minutes later, it was literally half the class sat on the same patch of grass and we managed to all really talk to one another then. We all had our lunch with us. So it just happened to be that we had all found each other. Um, and that's when we all started you know, talking and moving around and it was a beautiful sunny day and we took selfies and photos. And, and, and I think that, that master's class was, was um, very friendly. Uh, we all planned so many things together outside of the university. We all had study days together. And um, I think it all started there in the quad that sunny day. So I think that's a very special memory. Uh, yeah, um, I had the longest to think and I still don't. How I did learn to meet because we had an amazing trip to China. Um, we spent two weeks in China exploring concrete suburbs and strange kind of new towns, kind of Versailles style castles, but in a kind of housing estate formula. Um, that was kind of super fun. Um, I the bar barbecue is what <laughs> always used to be a highlight of the calendar and the summer show. I think the summer show is always great for the architects because you're kind of building. So it's the sort of there's the release of having finished, and then the kind of the, the new stress of suddenly all these people who all want to build something different and uh, challenge that with springs. That was really fun. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have a particular one. I think it's just lots throughout. Any last questions? So if not, I'm just going to sort of wrap up by saying thanks very much for coming along. Um, the Bartlett got a, a really nice sort of award today. We came out as the QS number one school in the world. Um, and that the QS league tables are compiled by um, hundreds of thousands of academics in their areas all saying which are the places that they um, consider to be the best. And then about 50,000 employers um, saying which are the places they consider to be the best. And then looking at the citation scores of the research, so which have the academics whose work gets cited most by other academics, um, and so forth. And they add it all up together, and we beat MIT at long last. Um, so I'm really pleased about that. We don't. Um, it, it's actually, you know, we've been sort of number two for a few years, and it, 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 it's quite nice to, to make it finally to number one. Um, not that we really believe in league tables. You know, they're, they're completely fallible, and I'm sure that when we go down, we'll say, well, that's just, you know, one of those things. Um, so that's one. It's really particularly nice because this is the centenary year for the Bartlett. Um, so it's the centenary of Herbert Bartlett, the, the construction um, manager and civil engineer who, I think he constructed London Bridge. Is that right? Or was it Tower Bridge? Tower Bridge. Tower Bridge. Yeah, the constructor of Tower Bridge, um, who anonymously donated money to build what's called the Pearson Building in the front quad, one of the one of the wings of the front quad of UCL, to house uh, sculpture, architecture, and statistics, which is a very traditional uh, combination of, of UCL uh, subject areas. It's always been very interdisciplinary, UCL. Um, but he gave that money anonymously, and it wasn't until 1919 that he agreed to have his name uh, sort of revealed when he gave money for two chairs uh, so the Bartlett Professor of Planning and the Bartlett Professor of Architecture, and he endowed those two chairs. Um, and so Herbert, as he's called, Bartlett, uh, named the school, put his name on the school, a um, hundred years ago. And so it's really quite nice that we've made it to global number one in just a hundred years. Um, <laughs> so those were the two things I was going to say. And actually, one thing we can say about this is that there are a series of events taking place for the centenary. Uh, there's a wonderful campaign that you can log on to Bartlett100. Um, dot com, com, yes, um, and it gives a story a day about um, things that we're very proud of having happened here. Um, but there's also a series of events that are taking place throughout the year, 
And if you were to come here for your, uh, for your uh, postgraduate studies, there would be a series of events still taking place from the beginning of next term. Uh, but please do keep a watch on that, whether or not you decide to come. Many of these events are open, um, and you'll be very welcome to come along anyway. So thank you all. I hope you think um, about this place and think it's a good, good idea to study things. Um, if you have any questions, there are always people around who are prepared to ask, answer and, um, and give you guidance on that. So you're very welcome to just uh, to come in and, and try and find somebody or phone up or email. Okay. So thank you all very much. And thank you.